As many people know, there's a bit of a friendly rivalry going on in the Anglosphere. Well, at least there's a rivalry going on between America and all the other Anglo countries, especially our forefather country of the United Kingdom, as not only did they steal the colors of our flag, but they also stole our language and a whole bunch of city names. Like, what the heck? Did they think no one would notice? In all seriousness though, it is quite fascinating that such a relatively small nation such as England could not only impart its culture onto such large swaths of the planet, but were also able to beat out other competing cultures throughout hundreds of years of immigration to their overseas colonies, forming the politically unaffiliated but culturally linked bloc of Anglophone countries around the world. Hundreds of years ago, who would have thought that such a small band of settlers in North America would arguably be the start of one of the mightiest empires the world had ever seen? But as many people know, this path certainly wasn't an easy one, and the story of one of Britain's first colonies has quite the fascinating history, one which has shaped the entire country, and by extension, the whole world. Even though the first permanent British colony in the Americas was in Jamestown in Chesapeake Bay, Virginia, in those early days, in the early 1600s, one of the more prosperous colonies was actually in the north, that being the Massachusetts Bay Colony founded in the far north by the private Massachusetts Bay Company, and some of the first settlers were religious dissidents who were unsatisfied with the Anglican Church, or the Church of England. These settlers, known as the Puritans, would suffer many grueling years of disease and famine, not to mention weather that they were completely unprepared for, as even though the colony lied at about the same latitude as Spain, we now know that the reason that Western Europe is warmed is because of the Gulf Stream that carries currents of warm water northeast while largely leaving North America unaffected. Their relations with the surrounding Native American tribes were largely mixed, with some interactions being cordial, while others were hostile. But the Native peoples belonged to many different groups, some of which would naturally fare better than others, while disease and warfare took the rest. Of the Algonquin branch of Amerindians, the Wampanoag, Pequot, Abenaki, and the Massachusetts are the best known, the latter of which is where the colony name comes from, of course, while others farther north were more closely related to the Iroquois nations, which, if you remember from the video over Appalachia, were the people group who migrated south in the Blue Mountains to become the Cherokee people. As British settlements rapidly expanded from the coast, many of these tribes were pushed further inland and more settlements were established in the vicinity of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, a region which would eventually be known as New England. Originally, the name of New England was used to refer to almost all of the northern British colonies, including New York and New Jersey, but eventually evolved to only include the five colonies east of New York, that being Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, and that's right, Plymouth, the forgotten colony that largely consisted of Bristol, Plymouth, and Barnstable counties. Plymouth Colony was the region that was founded by the group that we today would refer to as the Pilgrims, a group of Puritan refugees who wished to establish their own religious laws free from British rule in the New World. And although mostly a success, Plymouth would eventually be annexed by Massachusetts in the late 17th century. So keep in mind, although not all Puritans were pilgrims, the pilgrims were a bit more hardlined and strict than the Puritans. During this time, the vast majority of settlers in New England were of English or Welsh stock, but there were also outposts of Scots-Irish settlers on the fringes of the colonies in the north, but similar to other regions, these peoples would bleed together into a single unified American nation. Perhaps the best example of a somewhat large group of settlers for the time arriving in New England was the Mayflower, a ship which contained the 100 Pilgrim settlers who would sign the Mayflower Compact and establish the Plymouth Colony in the 1620s. Today, it's estimated that around 12 to 25 percent of the American population might be able to trace at least one ancestor to those that arrived on the Mayflower, as despite being only 100 initial settlers, their descendants not only multiplied rapidly on the frontiers of this new land, but also intermixed with other newly arriving settlers, and it can be assumed that a large chunk, if not almost all of the Americans of old stock English descent in the New England area, could trace some of their ancestry back to the Mayflower, and over the centuries this has greatly contributed to their regional identity. Much like Appalachia, the region of New England is not a political entity, but a cultural one, with its influence stretching much farther than the actual region itself, although by no means are the New Englanders, or New English, a culturally or ethnically homogenous group. 
During the colonial period, there were large numbers of ethnically Frenchmen from Acadia who were expelled to New England following the French defeat in the French and Indian War, and there was even a small Portuguese community in the islands of Nantucket and Duke since the 17th century, but the first major ethnic and religious changes wouldn't occur until post-independence. Now, as to why exactly the states of New England became independent while Canada and other neighboring British colonies remained loyal is a topic for another day. But one interesting fact regarding the region is that Maine was technically a part of Massachusetts until 1820, and Vermont was a part of New York until 1777, when Vermont essentially declared independence from both England and the other colonies, although it's debated whether the Vermont Republic was a legitimate political entity, and Vermont actually wasn't admitted into the Union until 1791. Before and after independence from the British, the states of New England had shared a close bond, and it was even proposed that New England secede to become its own country, and there are many cultural quirks shared by the New England states, such as the large French influence brought on by the Acadian settlement, which, along with their proximity to Quebec, contributed to French spoken in the north, Maine having the highest proportion of French speakers in the country after Louisiana. The next migration wave to hit New England, possibly one of the largest of all times, was the wave of Irish Catholics who flooded the state in the mid to late 1800s, especially Massachusetts, which is how Boston gained its reputation as the hub of the Irish American community, and this was followed shortly thereafter by Italians, largely in the south, as well as Germans in the north, and ironically, New England went from the region with the most solidly Anglo-Protestant culture to one of the least by the turn of the 20th century. Other immigrants in the early 20th century included those from Poland and other Eastern European nations, along with a large number of Ashkenazi Jews, and following suit with many other areas of the Northeast, a large wave of black Americans from the South started to settle in major cities such as Boston, Providence, or Hartford as a part of the Great Migration North. New England was not simply a recipient of migrants for most of its history, however, as many descendants of the original settlers of New England would go on to move westward once the U.S. borders started to inch in that direction, with many of the Anglo pioneers of the Midwest being of New England stock, which would have extended all the way to the prairie states of the Dakotas or even further. So, similar to how many in the American Southwest, especially Texas, have ancestry from the Appalachian region, many in the Midwest have ancestry from the New England region, at least those who aren't descended from immigrants from other countries such as Germany or Scandinavia. One major difference between the Appalachian and New England regions is that New England is far more developed metropolitan-wise, with much of the area between Boston and New York City being one huge urban sprawl, with the area often characterized as part of a larger megalopolis known as the Boss Wash region, meaning a contiguous string of cities stretching all the way from Boston to Washington, D.C., containing nearly 55 million people, or one-fifth of the entire country's population. Added together, the entire region of New England contains around 15 million people, less than a third of England's population, and if it were ranked by population in the United States, it would lie in fifth place behind California, Texas, Florida, and New York, so not too shabby overall. The population density in the southeastern portion of the New England region is quite high due to the saturation of towns and medium-sized metropolitan cities, being quite comparable to many of the more crowded areas of Western Europe, such as England or the Netherlands, while conversely, the northern portion of the region is one of the most sparsely populated areas in the eastern part of the country having a population density more similar to Sweden or Norway, although worth noting still higher than Canada or many of the flyover mountain states. Hence, the culture of these two subregions, although still heavily linked, are quite divergent, with the southern New England urban region having more in common with lower New York State or New York City, while northern New England has more in common with the more rural upper New York State or even the maritime provinces of Canada. More recent migrants to the New England region started in the 1970s to 80s and included diverse groups of people, the likes of which most of New England had never seen before in large numbers, mostly hailing from Latin America and Asia, with large numbers of Dominicans and Puerto Ricans settling in the southern region of New England, with there also being a substantial Brazilian and Cape Verdean community forming and partially integrating with the Portuguese community of the region, seeing their shared culture, religion, and language. The region of New England today has some of the highest concentrations of French, Portuguese, Irish, Italian, Polish, Jewish, Puerto Rican, and Cape Verdean Americans in the entire United States, 
without a doubt being one of the most ethnically diverse states, despite being less racially diverse than the entire country on average. Although ethnic, racial, and religious makeup varies drastically by county, overall around 80% of the region identifies as white according to the United States Census, with higher than 90% in the northern three states of Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, while there are an increasingly large number of Asian and Latino communities. The region also distinguishes itself by its extreme religious diversity as well, having one of the largest irreligious, Catholic, and Jewish populations as a proportion of the total population, with Vermont having the highest proportion of irreligious people in the nation at 41%, while Rhode Island has the highest proportion of Catholics in the nation at 43%. So who exactly are the people of New England? Well, it's a difficult question to answer, seeing as to how, even though it started out as the quintessential English Protestant region, it has since evolved to a region with a highly unique culture and background drawn from many, many different sources that has created the diverse patchwork of New England, which has impacted far more than just the region itself. So please, let me know your thoughts on New England and its historic and modern people. And for today's poll, let me know another region of the US or Canada you'd like to know more about. And as always, this has been Mason. Thanks for watching, everyone. I'll see you next time.